coming. <laughs> okay, let me just see. It says we're live now. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Let's do. Okay. All right. Woo! I'm gonna turn that off. Um, we're sorry, everybody. We're a little bit late. <laughs> we had technical <laughs> difficulties. Um, I'm just gonna take a second to share this into some groups, and yeah. uh, then we'll get talking. I'm gonna share this in. Uh, Tiara, are you sharing right now? I am about to. Okay, I'll get it in here. Oh my god. <laughs> Oh, whoops. Uh, going to, um... Um, I just shared in Vermilion Unites for Equality. I shared in my group. Look at us go. Yeah. <laughs> Girl power. Right? Yeah, we Love uh, group, honestly. It was a nice conversation before all of this, um, how women are just like, have been doing the damn thing. Mm -hmm. They've been out here, they've been doing it. Mm -hmm. um, okay, I'm gonna open this up so I can see some comments as they come, if they come. Oh, I guess I should put this on my profile too. Oh my goodness, okay. All right. Hello, everybody. Hi. 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 Um, I guess we'll start with uh, introductions, just so everyone knows who we are. Uh, my name is Taylor McNally. I am with um, Inclusive Canada. I have my notes here. Of course, we want to uh, acknowledge the land that we are on and where we are calling in from. Um, so I am in Treaty 7. That is the traditional territory of Kainai, Higani, Sutina, Six Sika and the Stony Nakoda First Nations. Uh, I'm gonna take this over to Stacy. I don't know how your screens look. I think they're all different. So Stacy, go for it. Okay. Uh, uh, uh I am here on Selk's territory in the Okanagan. Uh, this is the unceded territory of the Selk's people uh, currently occupied by the Canadian government. And I am blessed enough to live here and be part of this community. Yara. Oh, sorry. My name's, <laughs> it's a leg. Um, my name's Tiara. I'm with the Fight for Equity. I'm on Treaty 6 land. And yeah. Thank you. Uh, Angela. Hi, I'm Angela Scott. I'm doing Be the Change Drum Heller and bringing it to the valley out here. We're Treaty 7. So. Yay, thanks for being here. Yay. Yay, Claire, you up. Hey. <laughs> Hopefully, is she frozen? Hi, I'm, I'm Claire. I am from Water Warriors at YEG here in Edmonton, also um, on Treaty 6. And I'm uh, super happy to be here. Thanks. Tigra? Hi, I'm Tigra. I'm with Vermilion Unites for Equality. And right now I'm in Treaty 6 territory. And thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. Ashley. <laughs> Uh, everybody, my all my relations. My Cree name is uh, Wind Woman. My name is my English name is Ashley, and I am founder of Indigenous Peoples for Equality and uh, part of this wonderful coalition with these wonderful ladies. Yeah. Treaty Six Territory here in Edmonton. Yes, thank you for being here. Yeah, it's kind of fun. We all uh, we all work together too with the Alberta Humanitarian Initiative, which is a new launch. And uh, I'm so grateful to know all of you and to be able to work together in Alberta because it's wild out here. Um, but uh, I thought uh, after conversations just between ourselves today of you know the, the idea of Remembrance Day. Uh, we just celebra celebrated uh, Indigenous Remembrance Day as well. Um, and I, the conversations that were happening, I thought were kind of really important to be able to get out to people because once again, even as a Black woman, especially this year, I'm constantly learning things 
every day. Um, and there's so much I didn't know. And so uh, I'm really grateful that all of you have gathered here today to either listen and learn or offer perspectives, different perspectives or some knowledge on, on this topic. So um, Stacy, I think I'm gonna let you start with uh, however you'd like to kick this off. I mean, I'd rather this just be, you know, we, we have people watching and I know we're all a little nervous of that. This is our first group conversation that is public though we are talking all day every day um but just to, off the top of the head whatever you'd like to start off with um and i just recognize i just noticed that i spelt our organization name wrong on your name <laughs> 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 take it away i'm going to change that right now <laughs> okay so uh first off i just want to recognize that i have a lot to learn so what i'm speaking on is just from my own community and family stories and what little research I have been able to come across. Um, so there's a lot more out there. I don't, I don't even claim to know an eighth of what is to learn around our Indigenous veterans. Uh, but I'll speak a little bit about some of the stories that I have heard. Um, first of all, recognizing a lot of people actually are aware of the the Indigenous vets that did really recognizable things. So things like the Cree Code Talkers, although I didn't realize most people only recognize the Navajo um, down in the States, but also the Cree and other people up here, the Anishinaabe, I know we're part of it as well. Uh, they were Code Talkers and they were recruited for that in uh, World War II. In World War I, our Indigenous people were the, the snipers. They they were sought after for their ability uh, in that area. And we have people like uh, Tommy Prince, who is a highly recognized veteran, uh, an Anishinaabe man, and who I've had the pleasure of knowing his great granddaughter and granddaughter, who are also amazing Indigenous women. Um, with that said, I think what often isn't seen is what happened before, during, and after the, the world wars especially. Uh, first, we were not considered people on this land uh, until 1960 when we got to vote and be citizens. Uh, so that means during World War I and II, it was, we were not citizens of a country we were fighting for. Um, and there was a lot that came with that. So. It wasn't until partway through the Second World War that Indigenous people were able to join the Canadian Armed Forces. Uh, they actually would have been part of the British. Um, they were allowed to join when other soldiers were running out because of death. And that is why we were allowed to join. In order to join, we had to give... <laughs> My phone's making noise, or my my computer. I'm sorry about that. I don't know how to turn that off. Um, <laughs> with that, that's that was a good reality check of what I'm talking about here. Uh, with that said, a lot of our people gave up their status rights um, in what's called enfranchisement. Uh, once that happened, you lost all rights that were given to us. Uh, during with the proclamation of 1763 uh, and those type of things that did give us some benefits. See, that's something I just learned about today too. Like, I didn't yeah, know. and it, it wasn't just soldiers that went through forced enfranchisement. Uh, it was also anybody that got a post-secondary education. Um, it was women who married outside of their nation. Um, and some of those rights have been given back, others have not been. And even the rights that have been given back have been given back with a lot of exceptions to them. Mm -hmm. um, and so one generation will get their status back, but the next won't and, and things like that. And another reality of that is that that often meant because in this, in during the world wars and, and way past the world wars, we were forced to live on reserve. Um, but that's where our whole community was. So if you're given enfranchisement, you couldn't live on your reserve. So when you came back from the war, you didn't have a home to go to. You weren't allowed to go back with your family on the reserve um, and had to live somewhere else. So 
that is an obvious whole set of issues like to be taken away from the land that you survived on and your community and your family to go live in isolation in some city is devastating uh to say the least so yeah and it, name changes had to happen uh we were recruited specifically because our lives weren't considered valuable. And so we were put in frontline situations and dangerous situations that they didn't want white Canadians to be put in as well. So there's there's a lot of legacies that live on today around that. Uh, people not knowing their last names, people not living on the their homelands, uh, living all over the place, being disconnected from communities and families because we just, our generation never got a chance to meet our families. Um, it caused a lot of disruption in our communities and, and, our <laughs> and I feel like I've been talking too much. So Taylor, you go call on someone else to talk now. Oh my goodness. No, that's so, I love listening to you speak because again, it's like, it's so much information that um, I've never been taught. And I think that's something, um, uh, Tiara, you wanted to speak on too, on how like this just hasn't been we don't learn these things in our curriculum. You know? oh, can, I can, I, can I touch on one more thing that I yes. keep forgetting to say? Yeah, do. I really want to recognize that Indigenous veterans were not allowed to even lay the wreath at Remembrance Day okay. ceremonies until the 90s. Uh, 90s. Like, yeah, like 1990s. Um, I have no idea. I, like, I have no idea, but they just were not allowed. And part of it from my understanding, and this could be incorrect, I'm not gonna lie, but part of my understanding is because so many of them fought for the British forces because of not being allowed to fight for the Canadian forces. Um, so that's part of it. Um, and also recognizing recruitment even currently uh, and the mass recruitment of indigenous youth uh, who, are living in situations where they're having a hard time following or finding jobs and and those pieces so they purposely recruit indigenous youth to go into the armed forces which is also a huge issue and it's like you know after everything we continue to learn about canada's truth the history it's no wonder people are angry and how do we still continue to ignore these things i just it just baffles me every day that we still have to fight for even just sharing these truths with people and the complete um, lack of acknowledgement of what's happening. I mean, obviously things are changing. In the year 2020, uh, we are not staying silent. <laughs> but the fact that they are just okay with using black and indigenous bodies as just exactly that, bodies like mm. disposable, let's protect the white soldiers and dispose of everybody else because they don't matter. Yeah. Um, something that was um, really important that you mentioned earlier, Stacy, as well, is the fact, you know, a, a lot of soldiers uh, suffer with PTSD afterwards, you know, and um, in, in a world where, you know, we're supposed to have free health care, these things should be easily accessible, even for the, a, a, a white person, a non-Black or non-Indigenous person, it's still hard to get resources um, for mental health, let alone for an Indigenous person suffering from PTSD from fighting for a country that he doesn't yet even have freedoms for, um, which is insane. And, and I think that's such a current, a current issue is that soldiers are still coming back with PTSD mm -hmm. and, and we in so-called Canada um, want to celebrate on November 11th our soldiers uh, for the one day a year and we drop them and let them live on the street and live in the torture in their own minds because of what they've gone through the rest of the year and I think and this is beyond an Indigenous issue this is a soldier issue where we somehow like to not think about the fact of the trauma that they're going through when they're there yeah yeah that's something i definitely like to teach uh touch on when i'm speaking uh, at events is you know how a lot of our um uh, the population that is houseless and living on the streets a lot of them are veterans um and we have 
a lot of people out here who claim themselves patriots and they are not uh, looking at any way to get on board with these movements to help the situation surrounding poverty or mental health access resources. Um, and it's definitely something that needs to be touched on because it's a lot of veterans on the street. And how, how can we treat somebody that way? That way? Look, whether you're, you fought in the war or not, but somebody who served their country in that way and um, they can't even have a home to live in is, is also wild. Um, Ashley, do you have anything you wanted to add into this at all? No, you, you're just here to look great and you do. <laughs> so I am told you I'm not feeling very well, so I'm just here to learn. <laughs> I'm glad. Do you want to uh, just uh, give a shout out for your shirt quickly? Because I love this shirt. And, oh, and okay. Yeah, this uh, shirt is uh, by a company local to Treaty 6. It's called Stay Rooted, and it's run by Barbara Dumagin. You can find her on Facebook. And what their company does is each sale that goes towards each sale that they have of their shirts or their sweaters, they plant trees back onto the land. Oh. That's so amazing. Um, could you so cool. could you post a link for that, Ashley, yeah. to some of our pages? Definitely. I will when you have a that. chance. Yes, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I'll make sure I'll come find it after and post it in the comments section here. Okay, cool. Um, We're having dog visitors with Claire. Oh no. I love your dog, Claire. Love him or her. <laughs> Sorry, trying to keep them under control. <laughs> Oh man, uh, Tiara, do you have anything you wanted to add in the conversation? Yeah, um, I was just thinking back to when I was a kid and in school and we had celebrations every year, we would go to the gym and there'd be big celebrations in um, mm. just remembrance of all the people who fought, except it was never all the people who fought because in my head, a soldier was white, like as a child. So I did not know the history about our black and indigenous soldiers. I had no idea. So like, I think it's important that we make sure that these types of stories do get into school. So our children at least have the opportunity to learn that before they're 30, like mm. me and you and a bunch of people. And I don't think a lot of people even realize because of back in that time, I don't think they realized that we still put our lives on the line, even though the people we were fighting alongside segregated, hated us and didn't care. We, it wasn't a team effort, you know, like it is, it, like it should be when you're fighting a war. And the fact that while the men were away, black women, black women were stepping up and taking on their workloads and everything. You don't hear anything about that. It's just back to what you said in the beginning, like women holding everything down. From the beginning <laughs> yes yeah yeah i know um we wanted to have keisha in here um I, obviously we've all been at this of course our entire lives but really feet to the ground for the last six seven months we got a lot going on we're tired mm -hmm. um so keisha could not make it in this one today um but she had some really good information in regards to um the role black people played in all of this and I, like we all had to we we're trying to do research before this like I learned nothing about black soldiers indigenous soldiers because like you said it was any picture you saw any recognition all of them were white and we I want to make it clear too that it's not um we're not putting anybody down right we just want everyone included where's right. the inclusion you know everybody uh played their role did their part um and should be recognized for that and i think yeah black and indigenous peoples did not get that recognition and i know no history i just learned about you know the the number two battalion um and we were reading on some other things as well before this chat um and that's it's really sad i wish i had more to share on this topic and i hope uh Maybe next time we'll get Keisha in here to speak on that. Uh, do you remember any of the things we were reading earlier? I actually <laughs> have it here. I could pull yes, it up. Yes, you like... do. Yeah. <laughs> She's prepared. <laughs> Somebody's prepared. <laughs> if you just talk about something for a second, I'll I'll find a part that's good. Well, let us talk about the March and Vigil that we have this Sunday. <laughs> yeah. Let's throw that in there. Uh, all of us are involved with. Um, organizing a march and vigil in Edmonton on Sunday. Um, 
We will be, re be releasing the location on Saturday just to ensure safety still, um, because we do have people who like to counter protest us, um, but we're gonna show up anyway. Um, and this is going to be uh, remembering uh, any Black and Indigenous and people of color who have lost their lives uh, to systemic racism, whether that's police brutality or poverty, um, mental health uh, illnesses. So um, anybody, if you, there's a story who has touched you um, or if you know somebody, we definitely come out and march for them. Uh, we'll have a beautiful candle setting at the end. We'll have some speakers and I'm looking forward to all of us being together. Uh, in one space and doing that, it's going to be amazing. Yes, it will be. Okay, so I'm ready. <laughs> so this is the pre-First World War. The tradition of military service by Black Canadians goes back long before Confederation. Indeed, many Black Canadians can trace their family roots to loyalists who emigrated north in the, 19, or the 1780s after the American Revolutionary War. American slaves had been offered freedom and land if they agreed to fight in the British cause and thousands seized this opportunity to build a new life in British North America. This tradition of military service did not end there. With some black soldiers seeing action in the War of 1812, helping defend Upper Canada against American attacks, a number of volunteers were organized into the company of colored into the company of colored men, which played an important role in the Battle of Queenston Heights. Black Milita members also fought in many other significant battles during the war, helping drive back the American forces. Black soldiers also played an important role in the Upper Canadian Rebellion from 1837 to 1839. In all, approximately a thousand Black Milita men fighting in five companies helped put down the uprising taking part in some of the most important incidents, such as the Battle of Toronto. Black volunteers also served with British forces farther away from home, including the Royal Navy. Indeed, one man, um, William Hall, would earn the Victoria Cross, the highest award for military valor for his brave actions in India in 1857. Never heard of him before today. <laughs> um, Black people in the West also forged their own military traditions. In the late 1850s, hundreds of Black settlers moved from California to Vancouver Island in pursuit of a better life. Approximately 50 of the new immigrants soon organized the Victoria Pioneer Rifle Corps, an all-Black volunteer force known locally as the African Rifles. While the corpse was disbanded by 1865, after only a few years of existence, it was the first officially authorized military unit in the West Coast colony. While rev relatively few Black Canadians served in the military in the years immediately following Confederation, a few were a part of the Canadian con contingent that went overseas during the South African War of 1899 to 1902. However, the first world war that erupted a decade and a half later would see a great change in how black Canadians served. So the first world war, um, many young black Canadians, so this was 1914 to 1918, many young black Canadians were eager to serve king and country, but at this time, the prejudiced attitudes of many of the people in charge of the military enlistment made it very difficult for these men to join the Canadian army. Despite the barriers, some Black Canadians did manage to join up opening or to join up during the opening years of the war. Black Canadians wanted to change, wanted the chance to do their part on a larger scale, however, and pressured the government to do so. And they did. So on July 5th in 1916, um, the number two construction battalion was formed in, I hope I say this right, Pick Two, Nova Scotia. The first large black military unit in Canadian history. So recruitment took place across the country. More than 600 men were accepted, mostly from Nova Scotia, with a few coming from New Brunswick, Ontario, the West, and even some from the States. The Black Battalion's chaplain was Reverend William White, who also played a leading role getting the unit formed. He was given the rank of honorary captain, one of the 
few commissioned officers to serve in the Canadian Army during the war. So while they were off at war, Black women in Nova Scotia stepped up and did all their like hard labor work. So their men could like do what they needed to do. So yeah, we held shit down like always. <laughs> yeah, so I can share this in the live like thing so people can read more because it's a lot of information that I had no clue about. Like it has second world war info. There's a lot. Yeah, it's a lot of information to take in. And it's like, how did we mm -hmm. learn about How does nobody it? talk about it? This? I think it's the coolest thing ever. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, I Let's get that into our history books. Yeah, yeah. and you know, we're in Alberta and it's, Kenny is doing some wild things to our curriculum right now. But I feel that's something that we need to be making petition, more petitions for getting these things into the curriculum. I don't understand why it is not. This is like, these things are huge parts of Canadian history. And I mean, obviously there's reasons uh, that these stories aren't being told um, so we can keep up with the stereotypes against people of color. Um, but again, it's 2020 and we don't do that anymore. Yeah. <laughs> it's different now. <laughs> So uh, does anyone have anything else they'd like to add on the subject or questions or? Um, uh, um, I just did a book study on 21 things you may not know about the Indian Act. And that brought to light a lot of things I had no idea about, like the, how do you say it? And, and friend, and franchisement. <laughs> Good try. It's yeah. enfranchisement. Enfranchisement, yeah. So I had no idea about that either. And oh my gosh, sorry everyone, my my video's gone. But I had no idea that you literally had to give up your treaty status in order to serve the government. Like a lot of the things that I read in that book were it was really eye opening and you know, like, why aren't we taught that in school, especially about black soldiers? I knew nothing about black so soldiers or you know, it is very, um, like when I think about Remembrance Day, I don't know if this is gonna come across wrong or not, but it's honest. When I think about Canadian soldiers, I think of white men. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if that's how it is for anyone else, but that's how it is for me. Yeah, I think that's how it is. One hundred percent. Yeah, one hundred percent. Thank you. And like, how sad it must be to like finally break barriers to fight in a war for freedoms and rights that you never would have the luxury of even experiencing in your lifetime. Like, we're still fighting for it. So that is no, a exactly. selfless act. They literally went out and risked their lives for the freedoms of others. Like, was exactly. there? I'm one. I'm wondering. You know what? What would, I mean, other than just being a good human being that we should all be, you know, what enticed them to want to go out and do that anyway? But did they think they would come home to better rights? So yeah, I, I don't know, maybe. I can, I can talk a little bit just from my people who I've talked to. Um, there were, so they would allow many indigenous men to sign up before the age of 18 during the World War II, at least that I know of, because I know of several that did. Uh, and that was an escape from residential school. So if they were in residential school at 16, that was an early exit for them. Um, and they would go to war for that. Uh, another sort of thing I'm going to, I'm just going to address really quick is for, for all the non Albertans, because often in Alberta you hear or for the Albertans, maybe? I don't know. <laughs> often, often we hear the term treaty status, but recognizing that not all of Canada is under treaty. Um, like I don't live on treaty territory. We don't have treaties with the government. Um, treaty and Indian status are two different things. So I'm just gonna bring that up. So it's um, just cause I know a lot of people don't know this. So it seemed like a good time to talk about it. I don't know why, but it worked. But yeah, so it's actually status. Um, treaty is something separate. Um, well, I mean, you want to explain these things now? 
Yeah. I'll try my best, yeah, yeah, and I'm hoping that maybe Ashley can jump in if she needs to, because I might get stuck. You um, but okay, so <laughs> treaty, treaty are the agreements uh, made between sovereign nations, right? And we have numbered treaties in Canada. We've got named treaties in Canada. There's newer treaties. There's a couple in BC, not a whole lot. Um, and a treaty is a an agreement between two sovereign nations or what it is supposed to be. Uh, so those treaties are, are agreements made with the federal government. So when we talk about treaty, that's what we're talking about. When we talk about status, that's actually something under the Indian Act. And status is, status is a controversial issue for a few things. If you don't have status, you don't get the rights given to us as Indigenous people. And there's a lot of reasons why somebody wouldn't have status. It's not always blood quantum, which it never should be, but it actually isn't always blood quantum. There's a lot of things that can determine your status. Um, and so that's something different. So even if you're not on treaty, Indian status is still there under the Indian Act. Uh, so it was taken away from veterans, it was taken away if you had education. Uh, if you had education, it actually has not gone through in the bills to get your status back. So if you lost your status due to that, your family still doesn't have status. Oh. Other things that can contribute to it is if you have, a lot of us have two different Indigenous nations that our families are from. Um, and so if one is in Canada or what is called Canada and one in it is in what is called the United States you therefore are not 50 percent Canadian Indigenous so you don't get status um, even though you are Indigenous so this is recognized with our borders so this is like a whole nother, I think, session that we could have. Oh <laughs> I'm gonna, I don't know. Did I miss I something? Like, let me get my pen out. Right? Ashley, did I miss anything important with that? Um, well, <laughs> with the treaties, when they, they signed them, it wasn't necessarily, it was a kind of a relationship or a, a business thing with the government, but because of the way that in, uh, First Nations people are, our, our relationship to the land, it was kind of like a natural law agreement to be like caretakers of the land and to share with everybody. So for peace and friendship is what majority of these treaties were for, mm -hmm. to share with everybody because um, based on what our teachings are is that uh, we take care of everybody. Oh, and I also have a book that I recommend. Um, I just got it in the mail and I haven't gotten to read it yet, but this is called uh, Two Families. It's called uh, Treaties in Government and it's told what the treaties mean from a First Nations lens. Nice. Can you put that in the chat? I can. I'm gonna just type it real quick in Thank here. you, Ashley. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> So it if we crazy. like, so can't peck away when, for example, that was on unceded territory, that means that there were no, there were no treaty agreements. Um, it's, it, we, I would say it's no treaty agreements that have given permission to use the land. Okay. Yeah. Is that, would you say that, Ashley, is that? Yeah, I think it was, it's a uh, Papa's Chase uh, territory. And Papa's Chase is the one that had their land taken from them and they're currently fighting to have their land given yeah. back. Yeah. Oh, okay. So un unceded basically means that whoever's land it traditionally was, was uh, did not give permission to anybody to allow the sharing of that land or the use of that land. Okay. So then it was just taken over by... Oh, yeah, so if you look at if you look at BC, we are almost solely unceded territory, mm -hmm. with the exception of like the Niska Treaty and part of Treaty Eight comes into Northern BC. But right. we are, we and there's a couple other newer ones, but we are not on treaty territory. So therefore, if we want to look at the legalities of it, we are currently under occupation from a another country uh, <laughs> i'm trying to i'm trying not to get it too because I, I know this isn't our discussion today but like we're basically being occupied by a group a nation that has not asked for permission to be here and 
we as non-treated First Nations people are not telling them to get the fuck out, which we could actually do under international law. Um, what we are doing is trying to get them to have proper consultation and recognition of the lands. But it is occupied territory. It's is what it is. People have been real nice, you know? Like when right. you say, you know, oh, well, we're, we're getting we're... fed up, especially with land defenders. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're absolutely fed up. And like <laughs> for so long, people like I've even been told by people, well, it's not your it's not supposed to be your way to be fighting with people. Well, no, it's not, but um <laughs> How long would you like us to sit back and let you run over us and yeah. take our land and not our land, take the land that is our mother and destroy her? And you know what? It's COVID. So right now is not the right time anyways. Right? <laughs> so, Y'all better stay home. No doubt. You know, just just right now. Right now is not the right time. You know? Just not right now. No. Yeah. No. no. <laughs> some of the um, man, the 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 problems. I don't even know how to. <laughs> we got a lot of live streams we can do. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of want to just talk really well, or point out how many land defending uh, situations are happening throughout Turtle Island right now. Do you know all of them off the top of your head? Because we saw what happened out east. We know what's going on out um, near, is it Kelowna? Uh, uh, near Caledonia. Kamloops, and then also Blue River, which is just north west of Kamloops. There's like, also the Algonquin Territory near Barrier Lake, Ontario, where they're fighting for the moose uh, to put a stop on um, settlers uh, over exceeding the population of the moose because it's declining and they're trying to conserve it. Mm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Wet'suwet'en is still under attack by the RCMP and by uh, the pipeline up there. Like it just blows my mind because coming from, again, coming from what everybody, uh, Indigenous peoples have contributed in, in all of our history to still be out here getting arrested, actually getting ran over, getting killed, being thrown in jail just for wanting their simple basic rights just for wanting to protect their land well, it and was was it land back lane where they came, got attacked with the rubber bullets like yeah two weeks yeah, ago? Yeah, that, yeah land back lane for sure yeah. i totally slipped my mind <laughs> I, I don't know how they're like there's just so many going on it's well, like and there's more there's more going on as far as i know with the haudenosaunee right around where um this is not the correct term for it i'll acknowledge that right off the bat where the oka crisis happened Oh, yeah. there's oh. actually another fight going on there right now around the trees and the land there as well. So the same exact, I, I my understanding is the same exact location that the Oka crisis, which was very poorly covered by media um, and made us look like savages. That's right um, by Land Back Lane, right? The same area. It's the same area. I don't. I'm. I'm a geography teacher, and I'm not very good with my geography. I'm not going to lie. But yeah, <laughs> right around the same area. Quebec. Quebec. Oh man. Um, so yeah. Yeah. 